just give me a second. All right, okay, perfect. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, today we have a very special guest from uh, Southern California. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for the past 20 years, and uh, it's Mr. Chris Dons. He's currently the national coach of women's tennis um, for the USDA at the training center in uh, Southern California. And uh, he was a former pro himself. He got up to number 600, or he was in the top 600 in singles on the ATP tour and uh, top 100 in the doubles. And uh, as a junior, he was ranked as high as seven in the US and also had a, a college high ranking of 25 playing for UC Irvine. And um, uh, as a coach now, he's been working with the USDA for seven years. He's worked with players like uh, Sloane Stevens, uh, Claire Liu, uh, Kayla Day, Nicole Gibbs, uh, Madison Bringle, who are all uh, players within the top 200 of the WTA and some of them even in the top 100 and top 50. So, uh, Chris, thanks once again for joining, taking time from your busy schedule and great to yeah. talk to you and, and pick your brain. Uh, yeah, thanks, all... Renaud. I'm ready for some big questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I always, uh, I always enjoyed, you know, those training sessions we had because you're very intense. Uh, you know, I, I remember doing <laughs> two on ones with you at down in Irvine, and uh, yep. yeah, it was fun. It. So yeah, good to see you again. Good and you. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, this time obviously, you know, I just want to uh, find out a little bit more about the training center and see how you guys do things in the U.S. and the way your structure is, because uh, maybe there's something. Uh, for us here in Sri Lanka and maybe something that we can implement uh, over here. So uh, my, my first question, Chris, uh, is actually if you can just describe a little bit about how the USDA National Training Center works, uh, you know, things you guys do, the type of training you all have, how you all select the players, uh, yeah. you know, um, the, the types of coaches you have and is it only tennis, do you have conditioning, do you have nutritionists, psychologists, all, all those things, if you can just uh, give yeah, me a so, little background. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll go right into it. So there's three USTA centers. The main one is in Florida, right. um, and that's where we house community tennis, wheelchair tennis, player development. Um, we, we do a lot of camps out of there. So we've got Orlando, then you have Southern California, which is where I work, and then you have New York, which is actually where they play the U.S. Open. Okay. So we have two satellites in New York and, and, and Carson, where I'm, where I'm at. Right. Um, in terms of w what it looks like at, at Carson, uh, so we, here's a, we have a good amount of guy pros. We have uh, Taylor Fritz, Edie Johnson, Sam Query. Okay. Um, we have Bradley Klon, who won the NCAA, so a great player. Ernesto Escobedo got the top 100. So we have, we have a bunch of good uh, guy pros, women pros. We have Sloane Stevens. Uh, she comes in and out, um, but she mainly lives in Toronto. Uh, my priority is Claire Liu and Kayla Day, who grew up at Carson. And they, but they started there when they were 9 and 10, I believe. Uh, so, so the women pros, not as much as the men. And I'm trying to build it up. And then our main focus is trying to build a junior infrastructure. So uh, right now we're looking at 03s and 04s is, is our push and even a couple of 05s. And so we have about 10 to 12, we have uh, 12 players that get invited. And obviously that changes at a young age. You don't know who's going to be good. So we, we pretty much it's by invite and, you know, who's ranked highest at that time, but it, it can change at any time. Um, and so we have two coaches that run that. Um, the junior program, I run the, the pro women, and then we have a guy that runs the pro men. So we have a small group there, but I think we do a fairly good job with the players that come out of there. And um, in terms of what does training look like, that's a, that's a good question. And so everyone's training is different. I, I know, let's say Sloan Stevens, she doesn't really want to train twice a day. Uh, what we normally do is, and that's fine. I mean, she's had a She's very successful, yeah. knows what works for her. And generally, as you start to get older, you, you know what works best for you. And right. so maybe better or some other play, people don't train twice a day. I don't think better does. Yeah. Um, for some of these players, the younger ones, I, I personally, I feel like 
there's so much to work on. As a coach, you want to work on your skill. You want to work on the slice, the drop shot, and technically getting things down, uh, concepts about tennis. So personally, I think for me, the younger players have no problem going twice. Uh, the main thing that I can't stress enough uh, to you, Renook, or, or to, to anyone there is the main thing, the reason why I think <clears throat> our Carson program is so good is we have consistent match play every single day. Right. And if you choose between drilling or match play, I, I would choose match play. Right. right. Because, you know, I just feel like uh, maybe we have so many academies and you know, it's pushing drilling, 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 which is fine as long as there, there's a purpose to it. But I feel like sometimes we don't play enough matches and that's where you really get to experiment a little bit. So, so our typical day is we train two hours in the morning, um, then they go right into fitness for one hour, uh, and then two hours of match play in the afternoon, and then, then they're pretty much out of there. Um, for the juniors, that's the same thing as the pros. They do uh, two hours in, in, of tennis. They do four hours of tennis a day, two and two, broken up, an hour of fitness, and then they actually say we have a mental coach there okay. uh, that works with them maybe three times, three to four times a week. And so the, the benefit of, of that is they get free training and they get a free right. mental coach, uh, free fitness, and, um, and and that's pretty much it. So so they, they I mean there there are benefits to it, but uh, we do fitness four days a week. Uh, Wednesday's a recovery day uh, for the younger ones and even the pros. So they go Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday's fitness. Wednesday's a recovery day. Okay. Uh, we also train Monday through Saturday. And okay. They have Sunday. Saturdays usually have to. So that's pretty much the, the layout of what's okay. going on. Okay. And uh, you said you select the players, right? How how does that happen? Is it on ranking, or how do you guys select players? Yeah. And at what at what age? That, that's great. Uh, so, like I said, we're we're trying to focus on O threes, O fours. Sorry, sorry, Chris. Uh, what, what do you mean by O threes and O fours? Kids born in O three and O four. Like yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the way we do it. That's a great question. I just assume that we all know this, but I remember when I was in the private sector, like your common question is, what's your birth year? Or they just, instead of asking what your birth year is, they say, what are you, a 97, 90, that's how we classify right, people. Right, right. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, so the girl I travel with is a 2000. So right. She just turned 20. But right. uh, yeah, so we're trying to get 03s and 04s. Um, so um what was my point to that that's how they're selected we, we try to take as much of the politics out we right. sometimes we get it right I mean, someone's always going to feel left out right uh so that it's by invite only we try to go off a of ranking we try to be as transparent as possible right. on why p certain people are getting selected right. uh, i think one thing good thing we've done at the usda is we're starting to be more inclusive and we're doing a bunch of camps just to be able to get to know who's where and, right. and see their development and work with the private sector and the coaches. Right. And that's something we can always get better at. Right. Okay. So, and, and do you guys uh, go and like uh, watch junior tournaments and stuff like that as well? Like, do you have guys who go to recruit? I mean, we're, we're supposed to, I, I personally, yeah, I've been, I travel a lot with the pros, so I, I don't get to watch many junior tournaments. I think right. I've been watching them in a few years now. Right. But I know when I was working more with the juniors, it's encouraged. Go watch. Because it, I mean, like I said, it, it, at these young ages, you don't know who's going to be good. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, someone might stand out. Like like Sloan Stevens would say, I wasn't the best. You know, I just did a uh, – she did a call for our juniors uh, last Friday. And her main takeaway, she started out with her own agenda, which was, I wasn't the best junior. You right. never know where you're going to end up. And right. I know all these girls that were better than me that, that won all these junior tournaments, and, and I won the U.S. Open. And, and so you just never know. Um, exactly, yeah. You, you, yeah, you want to kind of get to know everyone because I'm telling sure. you, there's no for hard work, and, and some right. people are just late bloomers. Exactly, exactly. You know, and yeah. Like you said, some people are late bloomers, and then also after puberty, you know, so many things change. Absolutely. Uh, 
Yeah. Absolutely. Gir girls tend to mature much faster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, than, than the men. And, yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, you, you just never know. I know a bunch of late bloomers that, that I could name that that they're doing pretty well now on the pro tour. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, in terms of like uh, career pathway for these juniors, do you guys encourage them to play college tennis? Uh, for all the kids who come through your system, or do you encourage some of them to go pro directly straight up with juniors? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. So, so our philo philosophy, or our you know what our agenda is, is we're trying to, to develop top one hundred pros. Right. Exactly. So we're trying to take people in that want to be pros. Yeah. Um, but however. I, I would say it changed, in my opinion, because I've been there long enough. I'd say maybe five, six years ago, right when I first came in, this guy, Stephen Armitrage. Yeah, uh, yeah, now, I know Stephen Armitrage. You know, Stephen, he did a fantastic job. He, he now works for UTR. UTR, he's head of UTR now, right? Yeah, but he yeah. did a fantastic job. and He split off and formed a college section, which is right. now housed in Orlando. And right. how can we incorporate, how can we try to help these players in college. And right. it was very beneficial because I, I will say not everyone is ready for the pro tour. Yeah. Uh, especially in the men's game. Yeah. Uh, the men's game, it's, it's so hard at a young age. There's only a few that can really say, I'm ready for the pro tour. And college is Correct. still a great option. So yeah. I think in the past, maybe we shied away from college. Now we're kind of embracing it. And I can name a lot of Danielle Collins went to college. Right. Uh, and the men's side, Stevie Johnson, who trains at Carson. Exactly. Went to college. Sam Query was going to Carson, and uh, he was going to um, was going to college, and and he ended up doing well that summer, right before he was going to go to USC, and so he turned pro. But okay. I can name a bunch of good players. Bradley Klon won the NCAs. He trains at Carson. In the men's game, it's it's more. He, he's, he's not played in college. Say again. He's not. Is there yeah. is like, another one? Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. I remember I was yeah. at some tournament with this you know, guy that played on the Pro Tour, and this coach came up to me. Uh, he was trying to recruit the guy I was with for, for Indiana. I think it was Indiana. Um, anyways, he said, see that guy? That guy's going to be top ten in the world. Yeah. I said, who, that tall guy over there? And he said, yeah, he's really good. And, yeah, he's right, Kevin yeah. Anderson. I said, okay, cool. I'll keep an eye out for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, let's say, let's use Claire Lua as an example. Yeah. The girl I travel with. That was a tough decision. Uh, mm -hmm. And I left it up to her because uh, she was looking at maybe a few different schools. <laughs> she pretty much could have gone ever, anywhere she wanted. She, by the time she was 16, she had beaten three NCAA champions. Right. Uh, and it she was still thinking about going to college because, you know, you get a free scholarship and the yeah. way the rules went out, it's really changed. So Claire could have gone for two years and then they'd pay for her to come back. Uh, that's the way it's working right now. As oh, really? Two oh, I, I didn't know that. So you can do that now? You can go play two years, go pro and then come back? Yeah. You, if you go to school in some, some schools, it's just one year. Oh, so really? you go for two years and then they'll pay for, you can come back whenever. Uh, oh, Claire right. did Claire qualified at the U.S. Open uh, that that summer, mm -hmm. and uh, and was also main draw doubles. And so she said, "I, I you know what? I think I'm going to give it a try." But I never forced her. Right. That you should turn pro. I said, "I don't want to be. I want you to make this decision." Right. And so, and you know, I could tell you, there's times she would probably say, "I wish I went to college." Right. 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 It's tough out there. Right. Um, you know. It's, so, so you, uh, so the USDA policy is, uh, or not policy, but uh, basically they, they encourage kids to try and go pro directly, is it? Or it well, depends. I, 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 it's case by, it's case by case. Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. I'll just say this. We, we came up with this pro pathway study. Right. Uh, have you heard of this or no? Not really. So, uh, not really. I, I mean, I, I know they talk about, uh, you know, different rankings that kids should have at different ages and stuff like that, if they're considering that. Yeah. I think the I, I, ITF has something like that. I'm assuming the USDA has something very similar. 
Yeah, so so we we took it. Uh, I think maybe over the last ten years, I can't. I think it was ten years. The top hundred pros and right. where they were at each age, and right. what they were doing. Right. And okay. So yeah. From that, we came up with to be top hundred. We came right. up with these ex excellence grants, right. and it starts at age thirteen, I believe, and goes okay. up to maybe age twenty twenty one. Right. And it's you know where you should be along that if you want to be a top hundred pro, where you should be along the pathway. Right. And, uh, and if you hit certain, if you let, let's say it's like, oh, okay, at age 14, I final of a grade one. Right. I don't know, what, something like that. Right. It just gives you an idea of where you should be. Right. Now, if you're right. really close to the pathway, right. then maybe college is it's not, still not a bad option. Just go right. there and mature a little more. Okay. Now, like to, for someone like Claire, who every year she hit the maximum amount of grants that we could offer. I mean, she was on the pathway every single year for, right. for the most part. Um, so it kind of gives you an indication, but that's no indicator whether you're going to make top hundred. But it, it exactly it helps for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and so, you know, people say I, that. I mean, the people who people who you know got into the top hundred, some of them have taken such uh, different routes to that. You know, uh, absolutely. Like uh, Stevie Johnson would say, "I've never played a ITF tournament." Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he says like junior, he gives Claire a hard time who won junior Wimbledon. They said, that means nothing to me. I never play the right. ITF. Right. They, yeah, there's many different ways. Yeah. Exactly. To top hundred. I would say I wouldn't, you know, and sometimes you hear like, well, Serena didn't play the juniors. Well, maybe she didn't have to. Right. At age 16, she was already maybe top 50. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Coco Goff actually played the juniors and got through it pretty quick. Right. And, right. I think by 13, she was in the finals of the U.S. Open. Right. Lost Panda, and at age 14, she was already one in the world. So she got through it pretty quick. But right. sometimes I wouldn't use the exceptions as an example. Yeah, 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 for sure. Unless you're that gifted person that looks I like LeBron James. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. Exceptions to everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, so some people are just have a lot more talent or gifts than others. So. For sure, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, just moving on. Uh, can you just talk about some of the things that you uh, worked on with uh, Sloan Stevens? I, I know you did some work with her. Yeah, so um, this is, she's a great girl. It, it, it's harder, you know, let's say, you know, at the, at the pro level, and especially you, the higher up you go. Um, number one is you, you better be certain about what you're saying. Yeah. Because they'll call you out on it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and she's also, you know, she knows what she wants. So it's trying to, you know, get your message across and try to hopefully they, they buy in. Um, things with Sloan is, you know, it's always the same. Like she's, what she does well is she's a fantastic mover. The ball she's producing is, has a lot of weight to it. It's a very good ball. And she doesn't like to miss. She's, you know, you know I, I know a lot of coaches, how, how can we get her maybe to step up a little more and take advantage? And you got to find the right balance, right? Mm -hmm. Someone like Sloan, that, that's where her, her strength lies, is, is not missing. But yeah, sure, take advantage of some of those opportunities when they're there and without getting too overboard, right? Mm -hmm. If you say, okay, I want you to start serving and volleying once a game, that's not her game. So yeah. You know, it, it's it is tougher at the better levels. You you want to get, you want to make an impact, but you you got to make sure that they buy into what you're doing. Uh, exactly. But she's fantastic. She's fantastic. We get along uh, very well. Right. Uh, so I feel like I can tell her, hey, maybe could you try this, and then she will try it. And then she she has a a, um, a private coach that she's worked with. So okay, you know, I collaborate with him and see, hey, what are you guys working on? And, Right. It's easy to get the message across, and hey, your coach is saying the same thing. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So she still comes to uh, uh, the training yeah, center. She, she still comes to she still comes to Carson. She's okay. been down in Florida during this whole time, and she lives in Toronto. But she 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 still has a house in in Carson or oh, right, in, okay. in LA, right by right. UCLA. So yeah, I see her every preseason. Last year, I got, I got a chance to go with her to Charleston, which was super fun. Right. Uh, at that point, she was struggling a little bit. And then, so it was a good opportunity to, 
you know, just stay positive, you know, because the press is so brutal. And right. she started to kind of come out of it right, right around then, and it was, it was great to see. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, Chris, this is the the Home Depot Center, right? Which is in Casa. Yeah, they have changed so many times. It, now okay. it's Step Up, and now it's Dignity Health. Oh, yeah. What's it called now? Dignity Health Sports Park. Oh right. Okay. Okay. Dignity Health Sports Park. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I've yeah. actually played there a few times. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Been yeah. around. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Um, and uh, Chris, can you talk a little bit about? the differences uh, when it comes to coaching men and women? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so I originally, I was on the men's side. You, yeah. know, and, you know, a lot of the people I worked with before I came to Carson, I had some pros that were on the men's side and some really good juniors and it was, it was good boys. Right, and, and you also did some work with uh, UCI, right? Yeah, with UCI too. Yeah. Um, and, the, and on I, the men's I, team. That's right. Yeah, with the men's team. And, and I told my boss, I, you know, I don't think I'm really good with, with the women. I, I right. don't know. I think the mistake. And, but it turns out I actually loved it. Yeah, I think with the, the women, you know, and I could be wrong, but I think they respond a little more. You've got to be super positive. Right. But I think you got to be positive with the men, too. Um, I think it's, you've got to be careful about maybe delivering such a harsh message. Uh, or, or the way you deliver it, I guess. And I think the women respond better, in my opinion, right. to being to a more positive message. Um, so it was, it was good for me. It's good for me to be around because I'm a pretty positive guy. So I feel like I get it along with, with a lot of the women pros, and I, I actually enjoy it. Uh, the, the game is totally different, though. Uh, but you know, one thing, and, and then they'll be quiet. Is I, I did a, I love analytics. And I put together all the stats from the U.S. Open. And I wanted to see how different the men's and the women's game were. Uh -huh. And the men and the women, so I, I compiled everything. How much they're going cross-court, how much they're going down the line uh, over the course of a match, how much they're slicing, how much they're coming to the net, how much they're winning first serves, second serves. Um, and what I found out is the men and the women are actually playing the same exact game uh -huh. with the exception of one thing. What do you think that is? The serve, right? I, I would think that yeah, so the, the first serve. So, yeah. the, so men at the U.S. Open hit five miles an hour faster than the women. Right. On the forehand, they hit two miles an hour faster on the backhand. Everything else was the same. How much right. they come in the net, how much they slice, right. how much they cross court to down the line. Right. And the serve was the only thing. The first serve is 17 miles an hour faster. Yeah. It was. And then the first serve points one, which is huge. If yeah. You are really want to help yourself in tennis yeah you got the first your first serve points one over your opponent is huge i yeah. win that yeah. uh and that's where the men really separate themselves so yeah. uh, the other than that uh you know everything's pretty similar right it's the same game except for that huge weapon of a serve so, right. Right. but uh yeah i mean i do miss working with with the with the men a little bit but I think I, I found a pretty good group of girls to work with, and I feel like I'm kind of made for women's tennis now. I, I actually like it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. That's good. Uh, and, and what about, uh, I, I mean, I know you worked with some of the top juniors as well. I think mm -hmm. when I was at LMU, you were working with Nick Meister, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, I know you went and you did some work with UC Irvine, and then you worked with some pros as well. So. Uh, how is it different working with those three different groups or sets of people? So you have the juniors, the competitive juniors, you have the college players and the, and the pros. Yeah. So here's my take on that. That's a great question. Again, is my take on this is, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there hmm. and hopefully I, I feel like still in the juniors, you can win by making balls. If you look at the best juniors, they're very good at making balls. And I feel in the same in college. Obviously, a few stand out. Like, oh, that guy, Stevie Johnson, you know, he's monster serve and great power and good mover. Um, but more so in the juniors in college, you can win by making balls. In the pros, um, you got to strike that right balance. Because just making balls now, 
yeah. is not going to be good enough because the big hitters can start to find the court more consistently. In terms of uh, preparation and training and, and all that, obviously, the higher up you go, you start to get better um, with what you're doing. I know with with the pro I travel with now, I'm, we're on it. I, you know, I, I'm communicating with her entire team, with her fitness coach, with her mental coach, with her agent. You know, we're trying to more of a team. And, in the, you know, in the juniors, we just – talk to the parents or right, right, right. I don't really talk to the fitness coach. I don't know what's going on right. in college. You know, we kind of do the fitness too, but it starts to get more specialized the higher up you go. Right. Uh, but, you know, I know a lot of pros that are like kids and love video games and, and, and some of the stuff that they do, you, you would say, what the heck? I, it's, it, I don't take it very serious, but at the better the better up you go normally that they start to get super specialized. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. And then um, in terms of junior development, right? If you look at say tactics, uh, the mental game, physical conditioning, um, what what would you say would be the priority when it comes to coaching an under twelve uh, or under fourteen player? And then uh, under 16 and under 18 player, would it change or uh, what is your opinion? What What is uh, the most important thing to train? Yeah, that's a, I mean, you're just you're knocking it out of the park with these questions. <laughs> what, you know, what, what I would do and what, what I've kind of learned uh, here at the USTA, because I, I have learned a bunch here, is you still, you know, your practices should be based around what you do best. You know, I would say 80% of your practice should still be around your strength. And as a coach, I know our goal is to try to get you as, as good as possible and work on those weaknesses. And the way I see it is to develop as many tools in your toolbox as you can. So slice, drop shot. You, you can't imagine how many juniors you say, let me see your drop shot. You just speed it and then, oh, I don't really work on that. Or, let me see your slice. The more tools you have, you know, the better you can probably become. That, that's not always the case. I know, I know some, I know one girl who's won multiple grand slams, a lot of grand slams, and she doesn't believe in slice, she doesn't slice at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know as a coach, I want to make sure you're the most skilled player that you can be. But going back to our philosophy here at the USTA, and I actually kind of buy into it is, well, I do buy into it, is, you know, 80% of practice should revolve around what you're good at and what your game is. And then 20% should be on your weaknesses or things that you want to get better at. So for instance, we call it the two areas of focus. So Claire's two areas of focus right now is her slice uh, and her first shot after her serve. These uh -huh. are two areas. So 20% of the practice is always spent around those two areas. Uh -huh. And then 80%, she's a good mover. We're focusing on depth. So we do drills to find ways for her to come in. But, you know, I, and you've probably done this too, which is a good thing is what you want to do is you want to get a player and then you want to, if you could close your eyes and visualize what, what is that player going to look like in four or five years and how are we going to get there? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the same with players. Like what, how do you want to play and how can we get you there? Mm -hmm. uh, I will say this, this sport is still focused around movement. So if you currently can't move, find a way to you know, work on that because yeah. this sport still is about movement. Yeah. I always use Superman as an example. If I could find Superman, he would be undefeated. I would just need him to tap the ball on the court because you would never be able to hit a winner. He'd just have to tap it in. Right. It's, it's a sport about movement. Right. Mental's huge. And then the last thing is I call it the three M's. I just made that up a while ago. The three M's would be movement mental and managing your mistakes. Hmm. Uh, we, uh, we had a call with uh, Francisco Roy, who's Nadal's coach, uh, and he was saying how important movement is. He was saying, if you want to watch someone, watch Djokovic. I don't think you're going to move like Nadal or Federer, but Djokovic stands out that we can all move like, like Djokovic, uh, but, which I think, oh, well, he's pretty good too, and he's flexible, but uh, he said the same thing. This sport's about movement. So 
make sure in practice you, you are doing some sort of movement. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, make sure that you keep working on getting, like Claire is lightning fast to really travel with. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying, how can we get her faster? And we might have hit her ceiling how fast we can get her. Mm. But I understand that that is a, that's important in this sport. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree too. Uh, yeah. And, and I think, you know, uh, it's becoming more and more important now as, as the game kind of speeds up and people hit the ball faster and faster. You just have to be so much faster yourself as an athlete to get the ball back, right? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, and that's what uh, Francisco Roy was saying. I'm not going to name names that he was using, but he says, yeah, you see Nadal practicing with this guy or that guy, and, and they look so good, and they hit harder than Nadal, and, uh, but then you see him move, and mm -hmm. then you know why Nadal can beat them. Mm -hmm. And then the other aspect is, uh, put them in a stadium and then see how they do with that kind of pressure on them. Mm. That's, you know, everyone can beat anyone in practice, mm. but put them in a stadium or put some pressure on it and then let's see how they do. Yeah, that's a good point too. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, Chris, I'm just asking this uh, from, you know, our perspective in Sri Lanka. Uh, so obviously we are, you know, a small country, our tennis community is quite small, uh, especially in compared to in, in comparison to the US. And uh, I guess in, in many ways, we are like probably a small uh, state or not even a state, I would say like a, a city in the US. Uh, what do you recommend for us in terms of developing our tennis? Uh, like what, what would you say is the most important thing? Is it competition? Is it coaching? Is it facilities? Uh, how can we you know, try to improve um, our, our standard? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll say this. You go down to Orlando and we have the nicest equipment in the world. All the yeah. high tech stuff. I, I get that, it. Yeah. yeah, and Carson doesn't. Not as much, not, not yeah. as close to the high speed stuff we have at our National Training Center. But that doesn't teach you how to put the ball on the court. Yeah. Uh, so that's number one. For sure, you want to get the a good team of coaches around. Uh, what, what the USTA did is we brought in Jose Aguirre's and he came up with a philosophy that, and we started to go out and talk to the private sector and trying to, you know, make sure how the game was taught. Uh, you know, so there was more of a unified kind of philosophy on how to teach tennis. Uh, but I always say too that the player makes the coach. The coach right. doesn't make the player. Right. And, and how many times have you heard, oh, I've developed three Grand Slam champions and I'm the greatest ever? Right. Uh, okay, but you didn't play those matches, right? Yeah. yeah. And let's say Sloan Stevens says, oh, I want to work with Chris. Okay, well, just because Sloan works with that doesn't mean I'm a good coach. But from there, someone else might say, well, that person worked with Chris. And Sloan worked with Chris, so maybe he's really good. But at the end of the day, it's the player that has to go out there and play. I, I can't take – I, can, I for sure with Claire, and, and I like taking credit for the losses. Uh, and it feels good when she wins, but she's the one that has to go play. And I, I, I try to remember that. And, and it, that really – that point really hit home when she had a bad year last year hmm. is – you know, I could take credit for, hey, what can I do better? What, what are we missing here? Hmm. Uh, but it also made me think, like, how many coaches are out there and they have a good player and they're like, oh, look at me, I'm the world's greatest. Uh, well, actually, you got a good player, right? Right. You got a player that's, <laughs> but right. you can do certain things, like, and you probably do this for a note. You want to show up with a great, you know, with a plan each day. Yeah. You want to show up on time. Yeah. You want to command the court when you're out there, you know, no, you know, you don't, um, you don't want to promote laziness or whatever it is. You know, you can only you have your non-negotiables when you're on the court. But the main thing is, yeah, if I were, you know, you want to create an environment, as you know, where they're always playing and they're always competing against each other. Because let's let's say I've heard this argument that well, bull and, and the bulletaries 
uh, which he did a great job. He produced, you know, Sampras and Agassi and Courier. Guess what? All those people were pushing each other along the way. Mm. So Jim Courier makes the move first. Mm. And then, oh, well, Jim Courier can do it. And then Agassi follows. And then Sampras is like, well, those guys, I know all those guys. And we grew, they're all pushing each other along the way. Mm. And it's cyclical. So you might have someone in Sri Lanka that just comes out of nowhere and st- does really well. And he's going to bring, or he or she's going to bring everyone else up. Like that person can do it. Right. It's always cyclical. And you'll right. see, like, we had Jim Courier. We had, it was unbelievable. They had yeah. Pete Sampras, Agassi, Chang. And it was, the list goes on. Tom Tom Martin. Martin. Yeah. We had an unbelievable list of players. And then we had this lull. Yeah. And, you know, maybe we've struggled. Now we got some good men coming back up again. Yeah. And the women's team right now in the in American tennis, we're crushing it with all the young ones that have come up. We did a camp and, and there were six people invited and all six players had finaled or won a grand slam and some had won too. Wow. So we have all these young monsters coming up and you just never, it's just cyclical. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but competing against each other, and bringing each other up that helps so yeah the more you can as you know you get these kids together it really helps and whatever you do an academy a national federation get them playing as much as possible and I, I feel like the rest of the world does a better job than we do on on getting these kids to play hmm. really okay. Good. like like you remember Renook or maybe it's probably the same for you growing up when I was growing up I didn't Oh yeah, well I'm going to my academy. So if you want to hit with me, come to my academy. And and it, I had to call people and say, Hey, do you, would you like to hit? Yes. With, would you like to play points? Yeah, yeah. Now it's so specialized. Where uh, you know, and it, we don't that's, obviously have. That's really ahead. funny. That's really funny that you say that because uh, you know after I came back to Sri Lanka, the whole dynamics had changed because. When I was younger, it was the same like you were talking about. You know, we used to just call the same guys we, that you know the same guys we used to compete with in the quarters, yeah. semis, whatever. We used to call them up and and go play with them. Uh, but yeah. now kids only train at their academies. You know, with the kids who train at the academy and with their coach, they don't you know go around play with other people. And, yeah, so uh, I'll use. I think we all the all of us older people think we remember you know we'd have to play people we didn't even like because we we couldn't just go to an academy but here's a great example is one thing i learned claire had a a, not the greatest year last year she Mm -hmm. went through the mental struggles and but one thing that really helped her is i said you know what we're missing is we're missing a match play we need more match play for her and that's what we've been missing and because she was grilling drilling great she'd play a match not too consistently, she'd win those, but she didn't get enough match play. Hmm. And we kind of changed that. I said, I, I need to get more match play. And if these women don't want to play twice a day, then I'm going to do match play first today. And, and then I, I'll drill with her in the afternoon. Or right. if they're like, hey, my shoulder's hurting, you know, you keep hearing the same story. My shoulder hurts in the afternoon because right. they don't want to match play. Right. Well, guess what? Now we're doing match play in the morning. Right. That feel, and that really helped her. Right. She had a great start to this year before everything got shut down. Get that right amount of match play. Right, right. Yeah, cool. And uh, talking of uh, Claire, actually, I was doing a little bit of research on her. I saw a picture of her playing at, uh, at the age of five, I think, and she was playing with the, the regular ball. Uh, what, what's your take on the kiddies' balls? I mean, again, this is something that has come up in the last maybe 10, 15 years. And when yeah, we, what? We, oh, a kid. Yeah, whatever, the colored balls or whatever you call them. Yeah. I don't know what you call them, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, so what's my take on that? Well, I know, like, let's say at the French Open, I remember I was off-site. Uh, real cool story. I was off-site, and uh, Kyrgios had just won a four-setter. And uh, there's, like, a little academy going on, and I'm with the player that I'm traveling with, and she's getting ready, and Kyrgios just won a four-setter, and all of a sudden he's out there, playing with his girlfriend at the time, playing two club members. Hmm. Uh, he, he wouldn't know. He actually, he enjoys the kidding right. part. Right. It was really cool. He just got done with four sets, and then he played three sets with two old timers and his girlfriend, having a great time. And, but the, my point was that 
next to me was the academy in France, and they, they had the orange dot too. And so, yeah, I know we've had some backlash in the U.S. And I've been in both. I've been in the private sector and I've been with the USTA. And I kind of like the orange dot because it teaches good fundamentals. Right. However, you know, some kids, hey, I grew up with regular tennis balls. That's fine. If, if you feel like, you know, you can play with regular tennis balls and it's not impeding your technique, then go ahead. But I kind of like it just because it reinforces uh, good habits. Right. Uh, now, now in so, the U.S., is it is it just the orange dot ball that they use here? Uh, yeah, we have orange dot and green dot. Ah, okay. Yeah. We have we have uh, a red color ball. There is the red, then the oh, orange. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Red, and the orange. orange, and then the green. Yeah, and, and I think I don't. I think France had adopted this first. I could be way off on that, but uh, I remember when it first came out. I was like, I was totally against it. Like, oh, these kids should grow up and then, you know, hit normal balls. And, but, you know, I kind of un understood why they were doing it a little more. Yeah. And so it, I personally, I love playing with green dot balls. <laughs> oh, really? It, it doesn't so go out, right? And it doesn't but, go out. And the ball doesn't go out. <laughs> I can swing so hard. And, yeah. uh, but I see why they're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, to me too, I think it's a great uh, teaching aid. I think it's a great way to teach kids, yeah. you know, especially if they're struggling with their hand-eye coordination, these balls don't bounce that high and stuff. It, it's a lot better that way, you know, and I, I would definitely use it as a teaching aid. But, uh, you know, here, over here, we have a lot of tournaments, like under 10 tournaments, uh, under eight tournaments, a lot of tournaments with these kids playing with all these, you know, different, different balls. And yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, I don't know that I also feel when you move from the green dot ball to the, to the regular ball, there is a little bit of unlearning that you have to do uh, because with that green dot ball, you can swing as hard as you want with open racket pace and the ball is still yeah. going to stay in, you know, uh, and, yeah. you, and you do the same thing with the regular ball and the ball flies out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe a nice balance would be to offer yeah. both. Like, yeah, exactly. if you don't want green dot, fine. Yeah. Then we'll have a tournament. And maybe they do. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I think if it was my kid, uh, if I had a kid, yeah, I'd start them with the, you know, the red. Because I think it'd be fun. I just I think it'd be fun to not be so serious. And, yeah, yeah. Feel good about what you're doing, and but yeah, there's probably some unlearning to going on. But and then at the same time, that can get expensive because I don't know how how easy it is to acquire these orange and green dots. No, you're right. Yeah, absolutely correct. And and the thing is, I've had I've had uh, parents uh, come and tell me, you know, they have two kids. One is playing with green dot, and one is playing with orange dot or red or whatever. Oh, yeah. And uh, and they're like, uh, you know, the two can't play together because they're playing with two different balls. So she has to yeah. you know, organize uh, two different hitting sessions with yeah. you know, a coach or whatever uh, <laughs> because the kids can't play together. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't really matter. It's just, uh, you know, a training tool. And you can, the kid who's playing with the, the orange dot can play green dot. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. That's yeah. a good point. I, I think it works well for the for the companies as well, you know, the, the sporting companies like Wilson and Head and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Probably uh, true. It's just like when we were growing up, like I used the same racket for 20 years and now there's a new racket every year. Yeah. Now I gotta buy something different. Yeah. You know, you're probably yeah, and even for the juniors you have, you know, the nineteen age, you have the twenty one, the twenty three, twenty five. 26 and then the 27 so you have it all <laughs> that, that's I guess the, the business side of the sport yeah yeah um, and then and, and moving on Chris actually this is a, the, the last question I have for you uh, yeah. this is pertaining to an, the National Training Center you know there are some pros and cons to having a National Training Center there are some people who are really for it uh, and some people who think that uh, the private sector works better 
private academies uh, you know function better and it's uh, better for the national associations to invest with the uh, uh, or to invest in the private sector rather than run their own program uh, yeah. what what are your views and what do you think are the pros and cons of uh, of each system yeah so 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 i have been in both um, you know the way i always saw it uh, is to, i think i had maybe 13 kids go to go to the national training center mm -hmm. when i was in the private sector mm -hmm. and i never saw that as uh, they're stealing my kid or my player and i right usually that you know i i saw it as hey great you know i'm as much doing a good job or right. and again it's the, the player makes a coach so i probably had access to better players right. at that point but um i always saw it too as oh free training take advantage of it and i never lost i would sure. do still once a lesson once a week um but i know people's feelings get hurt you know, coaches and players like first off if you're a coach and how come I can't work for the National Training Center? And a player, how come I'm not invited? So if you do have a National Training Center, what I would suggest, and I think the USDA is doing a better job, uh, is trying to be more inclusive and work with the private sector. So we're, we're one big team. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get input from private coaches. We're doing, we're doing call, virtual calls right now to mm -hmm. how can we be, include you guys more uh, you know, let's say, now this is me, and there's probably people that will listen and say, that's not me, but let's say I had a really good player, and which I, I had a few, and the, the USA said, okay, well, we're going to give money to your coach now. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to say it, I'm a pretty honest person, but I would use that money to pay for ball so I could also teach my other students. Too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't just use it specifically for that player. There's nothing wrong with that, right. you know, because there's some other good players too. But right. I, I wonder how you disperse that money. Uh, let's say, in, you know, do you just disperse it to a coach? Let's say you're a, an organization and say, okay, I'm going to give either the player the money or the coach. And let's say – the coaches might get offended. How, well, why does that coach get it? Just because he's got this player, he's not a good coach. Um, so it, it's a tricky question. I, I will say this, and I think we've talked about this, is, is there is something to be said to, to in investing in your own team. Not that our federation doesn't have all the answers, and I know a lot of pros that said, or even juniors, that said it's time to leave the federation because I want the one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. Uh, I want that. I want a, a coach just specifically for me. And if you have the money, mm. that's great. And there's been players that have done that are very successful mm. that don't really use our help at all. And mm. they say, "I'm going to do it my way." There's no right or wrong way right. to do. It. The only benefit of a federation is, is, like I said, free training. But you know, just learn from some of the mistakes we we made and. Right. And be more inclusive because there I've seen some fantastic coaches in the private sector. I saw a guy, you know, you know, a couple months ago and he worked with little kids and man, he showed up with great energy and boy, you talk about it, just an awesome coach because he kept the kids engaged and and uh, that's the kind of coach we need more of that they love what they do and, and they can we need to keep people in tennis, but uh, you know, I, I then the pitfall of an academy, like like we had talked about on this call, is sometimes it's more beneficial to stack four people on a court than two and get mash play. So you, you lose because it makes financially it makes more sense to uh, to have more on a court. So then you lose the match play. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like why would I right. do match play at my academy because then I'm using one court for just two players when I can do, you know, some point play with four players on it. Right. Right. That's where the, you know, that's where the USTA is a little better because got it more exclusive who's invited in. So we always can do match play. There's enough courts. Right. But um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I what do you think? I, I'm going to ask you some questions. <laughs> well, you know, like I said, um, for us in, in Sri Lanka, because we are a small country, 
and our tennis community is quite small. I think uh, having a national program is important because we have very limited resources, you know, so uh, we have limited uh, coaches, we have limited fitness trainers, and even limited players. So uh, if you have, say, for example, eight, uh, you take the top eight players in an age group, in the under 14 age group, if you have, uh, say, each acad or uh, two players in each academy, you have four different academies handling eight players. And uh, so only, you know, only two players playing against each other, whereas you can bring all eight of them uh, to the center and they kind of grow up together, they can travel for some tournaments together. Uh, and I think that, you know, that really helps that, that competitive environment. Um, you know, like you said, like the Sampras's, Agassiz, yeah. you know, pushing each other. Uh, so for a small country like us, I think it is uh, beneficial to have a national program. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, a country like the U.S., I, I'm told there are like 16 million players or whatever. It's uh, too spread out. But let me ask yeah. you, yeah. what would the downside be uh, to having a national program? Would it take money away from these academies? Would the coaches not want to go for it? Or? Well, uh, w one of the big problems, I think, is, uh, you know, getting like good coaches because obviously the coaches make better money in private academies. So getting some of the top coaches to come and work for the national association is going to be a bit of a challenge because it's difficult uh, to afford them. Um, yeah, that's, you know, a, that's a good one. Uh, that's, that's, that, that, that's one problem that uh, you're going to face. Uh, yeah. And then um, also, you know, Sometimes there's politics involved as well about selecting the coach and then the players as well. Uh, yeah, and you're never going to be perfect, Daryl. I'll, I'll exactly. make you. Yeah. I'll make you a promise if if you decide, okay, man, yeah, maybe we'll we want to go for a national academy. Let me know. I'd love to help. Oh, and awesome. Just tell you, like, thank you. You know some of the pitfalls and some of the infrastructure and what what thank can. You. Yeah, I'd love to help you with that. Yeah, that's, yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, something that we, we've been thinking of as well, because we used to have a national uh, program. In fact, when I was young, after I, uh, you know, got to like the under 16 level, I never really paid for my training back home. Uh, wow. because, yeah, because we had a program uh, that was run in the National Association. Mm -hmm. But then about, uh, I think about 10 years ago, maybe, or maybe slightly uh, more than that, they decided to just lease out the courts and let private coaches, uh, you know, rent out the courts and use it for their own programs. And then they scrapped the, the national program. I think um, the LTA did the same thing. Okay. They, they did. I, I think maybe they had trouble getting people in, so they kind of outsourced a little bit. Um, yeah. Right. It, Right. But o overall, I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, we've really, you know, uh, improved our standard. Neither have we really gone down in our standard. That, that's, that's my personal opinion. You know, I feel like we've kind of stagnated. Uh, but I really feel that uh, we need to do something to try and, uh, you know, try and go to the next level. Uh, I would yeah, love well, to see that. Well, yeah. And let's say you do form a national academy. Is just learn from, from some of the mistakes we made. And, you know, it is cool to put on camps, get to know the coaches, get to know who the players are. Yeah. Be inclusive that way. There's plenty of ways to bring people together. You know, maybe you start with a national academy with just a few coaches and your job, like, like Tennis Australia is moving, is you're just kind of going around and checking on what everyone's doing right now. Right. And building that relationship, which right. I think would be Right. Now, uh, now tell me this, Chris. This is another question that I just thought of right now. Uh, so, you know, we're we a small island. We don't have a lot of tournaments here. Uh, for our kids to play tournaments, if they want to play, you know, uh, international tournaments, we obviously have to fly out. So, India is the closest place. India has very good junior tennis. Uh, yeah. you know, Thailand has pretty good sure. junior tennis as well. There's Thailand, yeah. there's, you know, Indonesia, which is decent. Uh, so, if you had uh, a limited budget, 
right? Would you rather have a training program in the National Association or would you come up with a small budget to send some of these players out every year to play tournaments? That's a great question. That is a good question. I I don't know. I don't know what. If it was me, and, and I would like to oversee the training, mm -hmm. and perhaps you know I could get them to a pretty good level and build enough match play at home that if they do have the money and they can go out mm -hmm. and play, then they would be more equipped to mm -hmm. play. But it obviously maybe they don't have that money. A lot of these kids. It, I mean, it's a, it's an expensive sport, as you know. Absolutely. Yeah. If they don't have the money, yeah, and then you might have to provide grants for them to go travel, which yeah. is, well, yeah, it's it is important for them to get to see who their peers are in the competition. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, it's an expensive sport, so um, yeah. so that's what we do. I, there's there's some cases where if people can't afford to travel, we, we provide grants to help them. If, you know, they, they have the, they've shown some aptitude that they're, they're good, but right. I don't know. That's a great question. Which do you do? I, I, I guess I'd say I'd want to be more in charge of what's happening with the players. So when they do, if they do have that chance to go, they're more equipped or let's say by the time it's college comes around, they're more equipped to get a full ride somewhere and, Right. And get a free education. Yeah. Education. Yeah. yeah, you know, uh, something interesting. Uh, last year, as I said, I was in, in Spain, in, in Valencia. Uh, and uh, I was speaking to one of the guys at the ITF. And he was telling me that in Spain, in the 80s, the 70s and 80s, Spain, the Spanish Federation took a call that they were going to have lots of international tournaments in Spain. So they reached out to, you know, private sector and um, got a lot of sponsors and they started hosting all these tournaments. And uh, at that point, you know, a lot of the sponsors weren't very happy and most of them wanted to pull out because they were saying most of the prize money is going to the Americans and the Australians who are coming here. Uh, but they still, you know, kept with it and, and the Federation kept with their plan and they kept encouraging the guys to, uh, you know, to, to have these tournaments and yeah. they, they did it. And he said it was like an investment for 20 years, but you know, now, now it's paid off, you know, I mean. And that's right. And that's what Steven Armitage did is he came in and said, how can we get, he did a study on how it equates having more tournaments at home and how your players actually do. And he, he made a big push to get more pro tournaments in the U S and it's right. really helped us. Right. So Steven was right. He was like some, a genius ahead of his time and it sounds like Spain had done the same thing. So yeah. Yeah. So, so, that's, so that's, that's right. yeah. So the, exactly, that, that's so, another avenue is to try and, you know, host more and more tournaments. And, and another challenge that we have here in Sri Lanka is that we don't have like a homeschooling or a distance learning program. So for the kids to take time out of school is very difficult. Uh, the schools don't really give them permission to, uh, you know, to travel and, and, and cut school. So that's another huge challenge. Uh, yeah. So, you know, maybe hosting yeah. tournaments is, is another option. But again, you know, that, that, that uh, is another cost that you have to bear, hosting tournaments. That's right. That's right. Uh, but it sounds like something that might be even more beneficial. I don't know. It's a great question. <laughs> So, yeah, so, I mean, um, that's uh, basically where we're at. And I really appreciate the, the time that you took, Chris. Yeah, yeah feel free to call me or any time. And if you need help. Uh, I will, I will. I'll, I'll definitely take you up on that offer. Yeah, I'd love to help. Yeah, and if you, uh, if you have any, like, uh, literature on, you know, coaching and stuff like that from the US, USDA that you can share, uh, I would love to, you know, read them or have a look at some videos. Sure, I'll, I'll see what I can provide. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you have, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Rohan. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you once again for your time. 
and yeah. yeah good luck with everything i hope uh, i i really hope too that uh, the us is able to have the us open this year so good luck with yeah, that too i'm hoping so too <laughs> all right <laughs> all right buddy take care thanks yeah. okay okay bye